You know how Valentine's Day is the day that we celebrate love, but we love all year round. Well, Giving Tuesday is the day that we celebrate generosity, but we're, we, are, we are learning that generosity all year round is, is so important for us as, as humans. Welcome, everyone. I am so excited to be here today with Liz Hugeson from Canada Helps and with Celeste Flores from Giving Tuesday Global. We are going to have an amazing conversation about Giving Tuesday and also a little bit about sort of community giving days and their relationship to each other. So thank you both so much for joining me today. Excited about our conversation. Yeah, thanks for inviting I feel like we should start with, you know, I gave an intro to this before we jumped on, but um, with just a little bio about each of you so our listeners can get to know you. Celeste, do you want to start with that? Sure. I am on, uh, as Mallory explained, I'm on the Giving Tuesday team and my uh, kind of area of cover is working with our local communities. So there's about 300 local communities. Primarily, I work with the U.S., but we have country leaders who also have community campaigns under the Giving Tuesday umbrella. But what we mean by that is there's peoples in towns, states, cities who are organizing some local movement around generosity, and we're there to help support them as leaders and in, in this movement. And um, while they're geo-based mostly, we also have a group of leaders who are leading coalition campaigns around a cause or a culture or an identity, and those cross borders. And it really, to me, I feel that community is in the eye of the beholder. And mm-hmm. who, and if you have a community you want to create a, a you know a movement with, that's what I, I love to do. And I did come from that leader community. I was running things in Austin, Texas, doing a Giving Tuesday local movement. And um, then now I'm on the team supporting a lot of people who, like me, who, you know, are just doing, doing their thing in the communities. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Liz, tell us a little bit about you and your background and sort of what brings you to this conversation today. Sure. As you mentioned, Work for Canada Helps. Uh, we're an online platform where Canadians can give to any charity, any registered Canadian charity. So there's 86,000 charities on our platform and we're also a a charity. So we operate the platform on a nonprofit basis and um, offer really affordable technology to any um, organizations that want to do their, their fundraising with us. So we helped to launch Giving Tuesday in Canada way back 10 years ago. <laughs> when we first saw it starting in the US, we so we saw this and thought, wow, this is an amazing idea. We'd love to do this in Canada. So we were one of the first countries outside the US. Actually, I think we were the first. We were the and first. So, yeah, so and I've been doing this. also have lo- local community campaigns within Canada. That's right. So I've been involved since since then pretty much, you know, helping to organize for Canada. We're not as big a team as, as uh, Celeste is describing. So we're, uh, yeah, we're a pretty small team with just a couple of us, but so I get involved with everything. Um, so we have, we, as Celeste mentioned, have um, 40 local community campaigns and they're geographic. So there are cities and towns, and there's also a couple of provinces and we have some cause area campaigns as well. So there's like a literacy one and there's some trade unions that get together um, to organize giving um, as a community. And we have a youth movement as well. So we run that within the community um, network. So yeah, I've been doing that for um, for about 10 years. And um, actually this is, this is our 10th anniversary and um, it's exciting. We love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I so I feel like I want to kind of start at a foundational level here because I feel like everyone kind of knows what Giving Tuesday is, but I don't know that they necessarily know like what is kind of the driving methodology or values behind why it exists. So can we start there? Which of you wants to sort of take that one? Well, I can start there. And then um, I know Liz will have her take. And that's the beauty of Giving Tuesday. It means different things to different people. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, while Giving Tuesday, uh, 
I think people know what it is. And then once we have a conversation, they don't realize the breadth of it or the mm. actual natural intention of it. Mm. Um, it's just morphed into so many things over the last 10 years. So it, it was a day to, it was a day started the Tuesday after, you know, Black Friday, um, Cyber Monday. Tuesday wasn't taken, I guess, in the giving week. And a given week, we just decided on Giving Tuesday. Um, but it has grown so much more than that. It actually supersedes its, its origin story, where glo- it's mm. global. And what is the Tuesday after Thanksgiving in any other country? Mm. Um, and so, uh, it, you know, but it started as a day to do good, standing up a day in your local community um, in, or wherever you are and and do good. And it meant anything, um, expression, Mm. generosity in any way that was meaningful to you. But the movement has grown so much and we're in 80 countries where we have leaders like Liz in other, you know, in 79 other countries who are leading a local effort in a way that's meaningful to that country, to that culture of giving. Um, Some of it's not even in, I mean, obviously there's campaigns that aren't even in English or don't say Giving Tuesday. Mm. However, it is still under that mantle of a, a movement that embraces all acts of generosity, but it also, when you talk about values and methodology and how it grew, why did it grow? How did it grow? Mm. And I think foundationally, it's about co-ownership, co-creation, and really mm. tapping into distributed leadership. We have a saying, um, at least at Giving Tuesday, what we, which I guess you call headquarters. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I hate that term too. Um, but <laughs> we say that it is about um, tools, not rules. You know, it is mm-hmm. about people taking it and doing what they will, but us providing any learnings mm-hmm. um, to infuse local communities um, in any way to, to, to generate more generosity in their, in their community. And so th- when you say foundational values and principles, we're, we're definitely about mm. co-creation and people knowing where they live, knowing the best for what, where they are, not us coming in and saying, this is the best way to do mm. giving Tuesday. This is the best way to engage people in generosity. Um, it looks so different, but I think that that unbranded mentality mm was ha- why it, it, it was foundational from the beginning and then why it's grown to where it is now 10 years later. Mm-hmm. But, um, I don't, Liz, I don't know if you have a take on, you, you've been, you actually been around it just as long as it's been <laughs> a concept. So, um, you know. No, I, that was, that was really well said. I mean, I think I would maybe just add, we, we love to say everybody has something to give and every act of generosity counts. And that really embodies the whole principle, like what you call the methodology, Mm. maybe Mallory, Mm. Um, you know, people can get involved in any way that they want, however generosity is accessible to them. And that's Mm. what makes it so universally appealing. So, Mm. you know, it's really just about that fundamental value that we have that we want to help our fellow humans and um, so it just crosses all the boundaries and all it, you know, kind of unites where all those divides have divided us in the last, mm. however many years the world has been. But this is a way now more than ever for us to come together and um, unite in generosity and um, not think about the differences culturally or religiously or politically or geographically or whatever. Mm. I love that list. Um, Right. It's about our shared humanity. And it really is also about um, what you were just saying. It's giving agency to everyone to be a giver. I think sometimes, or at least in the United States, there is a traditional view of who is a recipient of generosity and who is a giver of generosity. Mm. And when you come to something like this movement, you're coming at it when inherently you're valued for any and all of your assets, whether it's your voice, it's your time, it's your hand, it's your, you know, sharing a meal, whatever it is that um, you have to give, you are a change agent. And that's what we believe. But I, mm. I love it. Right. It's about being human. And it's <laughs> so, so important that it not be just about the fundraising, like really important for keeping people engaged and motivated and, that's such a huge part of the message that that we talk about in our work every day is, you know, making sure that everybody can get involved. Mm. And there's a great example of that. I think, I don't know if you want to talk about this or you've got it planned for later, Celeste, but there's a group called Refugees Give. Wow. <laughs> what, you know, that's turning the tables, right? <laughs> yep. It's really about... Um, the refugees 
community giving is a campaign that's been lived that's been stood up to tell your story about how you give um, mm. and talking about the inherent generosity of refugees with mm. whatever community they join um, I think a lot of people uh, uh, see refugees as the in the ones that need mm. generosity in the help and I've seen in many different ways by by you know people in the communities in which they move to and um but amongst mm. their within their community of their refugee um community but outside of the new community in which they're in there's so many expressions of generosity mm. so that campaign in particular Liz is talking about is just lives under the hashtag refugees give and we work with a lot of refugee settlement organizations or mm. organizations that work with refugees throughout the whole process, right, of, of their mm-hmm. life, um, and giving them that mic to tell their story. Mm. Okay, there are so many things about <laughs> what you both said that I really want to kind of double click on, but I mean, I well, really, I, I double f- click on. <laughs> I'm gonna actually break that down and use it. I like it. <laughs> but I want to go back to this piece around this co-creation belonging kind of like unbranded opportunity. And I think this is a theme we've talked on branded. And so I want to explore that a little bit because I feel like in this day and age where there's so much sort of attention, people trying to get everyone's attention, Giving Tuesday really showed up and like cut through the noise. And granted, this is someone saying this outside. I have no idea all the blood, sweat, and tears that went (laughs) into that process. But to say that you you all really created a new giving moment, which is just tremendous. A new moment of generosity. I don't mean giving just from like a financial transaction giving. I mean, just this new moment of generosity. How... And there is a brand identity with that, maybe not brand in the way we sort of understand brand, like overarching brand, but like Giving Tuesday is a known entity that people identify with, that they're a part of. It's a community that really means something. How did it do that? How did it cut through that noise with also a tremendous amount of fluidity around what adoption looked like? Yeah, I mean, I think... um... It's a great question. How did it break through? So there's so many things that that I could say. I think the universal appeal is just so it's so easy to join in mm. that it's it really invites everybody um, in any way, and th- and that crosses over to organizations. So organizations have there are as many ways to participate as there are organizations. So a campaign, mm-hmm. you know, maybe it's a fundraising campaign, but it's going to have its own twist for every organization. Um, I think an illustration of this sort of unbranded or open, open source, one of my favorites is as the movement grew internationally, mm-hmm. every country that came on board, um, decided that they needed their own country logo. So they needed something that, mm. you know, spoke to the the global or spoke to the original idea of Giving Tuesday, but then made it local. Mm. And it turned out, we have, a, we have a slide of this, I could probably pull it up, that every single country logo was around a heart and it had country colors or country flag mm. elements or icons or whatever. And when you place those on a map across the world, it's so powerful to see these mm. 80 visualizations of Giving Tuesday, each of which is completely unique to the country uh, or the area that it's representing, but that that's tied together in a way that's absolutely magical. And nobody ever said, you have to have heart for your logo, or you should you know, use your country colors or your country icon. There was no rule that said that people needed to even create a logo or have a website or, you know, so it was just people saying, I'm connecting to this idea. It just gets me right in my heart and I want to do it in my country. And this is the way it turned out in every, all 80 countries. So I kind of love that Mm -hmm. um, illustration of how that open source just completely grew organically and, and always in some magical way it was always like, there was no rule, but it was always for the best 
of the movement and for the best in those communities where it where it was like it, i think that it just it succeeded immediately in pretty much every country yeah wow I hear all of that, Liz. <laughs> uh, I think the other part with movements that people, when you talk about cut through the noise, there's two, well, I think of two things. Um, how did Giving Tuesday cut through it to become what is a, like a holiday in, mo- mm-hmm. in a lot of people's minds um, or a staple? Um, mm-hmm. How did it do that? But how did it sustain it? You know, I think it's really hard for movements to sustain, to be self-sustaining when there is not a lot of structure. There is not mm-hmm. a lot of rules. Mm-hmm. There is not a lot of um, intentional strategies that you, you know, export to another country. You give ideas, but we mm-hmm. you certainly don't say that the United States knows how to make this happen. No, we mm-hmm. don't. There are some countries that do a lot of this better than we do. Um, but I think what it what it is, is there's still a nucleus organization. There's an organization mm-hmm. behind the movement. However, the only role of the organization is facilitation. It is not to uh, mandate. And, mm-hmm. and and there's times when somebody's using Giving Tuesday in a way we, we're like, ah. But mm-hmm. that's part of the movement, right? It takes mm-hmm. a lot of actors to make a movement um, happen. And when you talk about givers and donors, they use this day um, or how do individual networks use this day. Um, and I think it's because they found it a way to, that works for them. And this day, though, is really easy for donors or givers because it is giving them every way that they could possibly engage in. And it makes it easy. It's a low barrier to entry, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and our, even our terminology, I, I, to be honest, I don't say donor a lot because I don't be, that it inherently thinks of financial giving. Mm. And so I think because we've given so much agency to people, this movement, not we, this movement has given um, agency to givers and made, made it really easy to mm. enter and has made it really easy for people to adopt in a way that is meaningful to them. We have this underpinning though of an organization to help make sure that, that those learnings like feed on mm-hmm. each other. So when Liz is amongst, is in a call with all of the other 80 country leaders and small groups and summits and opportunities that we put as foundation for them to learn from one another. And so mm-hmm. I think that that is how the, how Giving Tuesday has now become like a holiday to people, but I also, and, and, and useful to all sorts of people and organizations, but then also how it sustained 10 years. There's a lot of movements that have gained a lot of great ground. And if uh, you don't have some of those tenants to keep it going, um, it, 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 you know, it, it, they don't, sometimes they don't last. Mm-hmm. And I think it's just, we've been around a block or two. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you're saying a few things that I think are really important. You know, we, um, I've done a lot of studying around sort of behavior change and habit building. And we had Dr. BJ Fogg on the podcast. And so we talk about, you know, what does it take for people to get over an action line, right? And it's the relationship between motivation, ability, and a prompt. And anytime people aren't getting over an a- action line, line, the first question to ask is, how can you make that action easier to do? And to me, this is an amazing example of that. Like you made what you said about that sort of barrier to entry. You made the action of giving of participating so easy to do and so multifaceted and so personal that, and then likely because people were seeing a lot of success, their hope around what was possible with Giving Tuesday continued to increase. And so they kept getting over that action line year after year after year. So I just love that. And there's so much of the science that we've sort of studied on this podcast that really supports that too. Um, but it's it's awesome. And like even some of the terminology, like you saying that piece around, I don't really say donors a lot, you know, but givers or, you know, people who are giving, even that, my guess is, has created some like shared language and identity that's perhaps different than what we hear in other sort of fundraising pockets of the world. And that maybe created this shared identity component as well in in many ways. I think that's a great point. 
And I'm glad that yeah. whatever I just said was supported by data. <laughs> <laughs> it's always, I always say that. I'm like, I love it when the science supports it. I, I know when it supports it. I, I operate from feelings and we have a whole data team that does not operate by feelings. They <laughs> count the feelings. So it definitely, um, and, and understand the feelings and to your point, how it changes that donor behavior. And I think once you've gotten people over that line, as you said, they have this, I, I know the term has been used, helper high of mm. just this this feeling of that you get actually more out of it than whoever it is that you're trying to, that you help on that day. Um, and once you cross that barrier, that feeling of, again, shared humanity is the only word I can think of, mm-hmm. like realizing at the very core of who we are, we are humans. And that's what differentiates us from animals. Mm. We care about each other is about collective and communal care. And mm. it, and that is the only way that we are going to shape and change. And it's, um, and, and so to, to your point about behaviors, I, I think those lower barriers to entry in any way. And, and we're just talking about Giving Tuesday right now. I guess we're, a lot of us are talking, some people might be thinking just the day, the day after Thanksgiving in the U.S. or the Tuesday, you know, Tuesday after Cyber Monday. But, but the, the idea here is that this is a sustained, sustained effort. This is a, a lot, you know, Liz and a lot of the country leaders are not just like, oh, December 1st, we were done. Um, it is about that sustained movement, but it also is providing these touch points where people can celebrate every Tuesday and that mm-hmm. content that you're constantly feeding to people so that it isn't, you, you want people to have that behavior change, but you have to continue, continue to give those, those, those points of entry. Um, and then, um, using more giving Tuesday, like a holiday or a day of celebration, but it really is a, a behavior that we are trying to institute year round. Okay, so you want some more science to support what you're saying? Yes, you <laughs> science. So this is amazing because this actually aligns with another episode that we have in this series on moments with Francesco Ambroghetti, who wrote Hooked on a Feeling. And he talks about two things in that book that I think are really relevant to what you just said. One is this idea that oftentimes just a giving experience, like a, a donation, you know, clicking that donation button is a dopamine experience or an oxytocin experience. It's an immediate feel good sensation sensation, chemical release in the body. What creates, and so I want to talk about this and we can talk about the retention data around Giving Tuesday in a moment, because I think you just sort of led us there perhaps with what you said. And he talks about this idea of peak and end points are the primary like anchors around memory. So giving our donors multiple peak points in their experience with us, some of those peak points are going to be related to giving. Some of those peak points are going to be related to calling them on their birthday, celebrating a different holiday with them, sharing a story on another random Tuesday, all of those things are what actually then cement that component. And so will you share a little bit around what we see with Giving Tuesday retention data sort of in comparison to other first-time donors or repeat donors? Because I think everything you just said about how you sort of organize this movement and manage communications and storytelling throughout the rest of the year is likely why we see numbers like that. Happy to to talk a little bit. To, there's so much in there. Oh my goodness! No, I know. Um, but I I do think that there's a collective peak, um, and there's other research that backs that up from Horizon Media actually that talks about how people really want to give on Giving Tuesday because it makes them feel like they're part of something bigger. Mm. And that's they're talking about financial giving in that case. Mm. But I think that it translates to any kinds, any forms of generosity, honestly. Um, so it's they're part of a community. They're part of an entire world that's coming together and doing something. And that's an incredibly powerful motivator. And and it's an ongoing motivator. Um, mm. And then when you add in the reminders, you add in the thank yous. Um, so organizations that participate in Giving Tuesday are becoming extremely creative. So they mm. they understand that the fundraising ask is only one small part of it. Stewardship, phone calls, um, mm. getting the board members involved, doing thank you, thankathons and gratitude days. And we have a thing in Canada called Thank You Thursday. <laughs> it's mm. huge. So the and organizations are really learning that this is an important part of the um of the experience for Mm. the givers, um, the generous ones. We also have a lot of data that shows that people get involved in multiple ways on Giving Tuesday. So Mm. yes, donating is is a big 
part of it, of course, but certainly volunteering and social media. I mean, mm. it, it started off really, I mean, for a lot of the way that Giving Tuesday grew around the world was through the social media. Mm. And since the pandemic, of course, really, mm -hmm. there have been so many fewer events that social media became more important. But um, the, the movement didn't skip a beat because it was already there. Mm. So those multiple ways that people get involved advocating and in just multiple layers of engagement, I think, add to that the theory or the hypothesis that you just put forward, which is that is what is cementing the relationship that they have with the organizations that they're engaging with and with the communities that they're becoming mm. more married to. Something that we sometimes say um, about Giving Tuesday is, um, and Celeste was talking about the day of celebration, the holiday, you know how Valentine's Day is the day that we celebrate love, but we love all year round. Well, Giving Tuesday is the day that we celebrate generosity, but we're, we, are, we are learning that generosity all year round is, is so important mm. for us as, as humans. Mm. I love that. Will you share just a few numbers with us? Like I've seen numbers out in the in the world around, you know, first time donors who give on Giving Tuesday are, you know, X percentage more movements that have come up in the last couple of years have triggered massive amounts of giving and Giving Tuesday is one of those. And of all of those, the data from 2020 shows that um Giving Tuesday had had the most donor acquisition, the most power mm -hmm. into it, like the most percentage of donor acquisition. Um, I don't have the specific numbers, but I, I do think it's, it's important to understand the big picture and then dive into the numbers afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for me, what the learning is there is it puts a really big onus on all of these organizations that are bringing in new donors and particularly younger mm -hmm. donors. What are you going to do now? You mm -hmm. really got to up your game on the stewardship and the retention side of things. Mm. And I, that's a whole other topic. <laughs> yeah, yes. Well, I think you've also, though, honestly touched on it in a number of different ways as, as you've talked about sort of this ongoing, my guess is one, in creating the this ongoing community of the, the global leaders and then local leadership, just that consistent touch point sh storytelling best practices that being at the forefront of fundraisers minds and their sort of like monthly the, the work that they're doing on a monthly basis really allows them you know we see so many kind of like one-time opportunities around training and support when it comes to fundraising right it's like your end of year blitz or your like december 31st like email toolkit right so many of these things that have these real book end points and then sometimes we watch fundraising Raisers, take those, implement them, but there isn't this sort of ongoing relationship component to it. And so it is easy then as we're struggling to check off things from our to-do list or, you know, these nonprofit leaders are pulled in so many directions to sort of lose sight of the fact that it is in all those in-between moments too, that actually are really critical to be sort of building those relationships and creating those ongoing, you know, peak moments and, and pieces like that. So I, I really, really appreciate that. And I'm curious, I mean, it sounds like you guys you know, share a lot of best practices a lot. I love what you said about like, this is about sort of a toolkit and then gives people a lot of opportunities to implement the tools that are right for them. And I kind of have two questions around that. The first is I'm curious, you know, Neon One is actually putting together this report soon that I'm pretty obsessed with that's called Donors Understanding the Future of Individual Giving. It's an industry report. And a lot of it is Get, is driven by Giving Tuesday's data analysis. And one of the things that I found really fascinating in this report is about this thing they called golden moments. And so it showed trends based on giving and even like the day and the time of day. And I know Giving Tuesday is a day already, but I'm curious if you guys have seen any sort of trends around time of day or other surprising trends when you've perhaps like looked globally, but also maybe segmented by geographic location or type of organization. Just don't know what you guys have seen with regards to that. 
Go ahead, Slug. I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit um, as far as not necessarily numbers, but I can speak to the, these these moments um, a little bit. But with Giving Tuesday, while it is a day that is celebrated that people say it's November 29th or whatever it is, um, a lot of our campaigns that we work with or movements, we, local movements that we work with, actually it define their own Giving Tuesday season. So some use the day, but some use mm. the day to start something. Some use the day to mm. end something the day that they do the whole week. The idea of like what times of day might be good um, is definitely, I think, a little easier to understand if it's a finite day and if it's mm. a if it's financial. So for a lot of our communities, their community campaign is a platform giving day where they have all organizations in one place. They have events going on around town. It's a 24, 48 hour period. They use giving Tuesday as that day because, uh, as the day to do it in a lot of the communities, Mm -hmm. that's a lot of the community campaigns that Mm -hmm. I work with because the the megaphone is already there. Mm -hmm. But within those campaigns, depending on the area, uh, this is U S specifically, there were definitely times that you lean into the, the the moments in a day that people are most likely to give. And so when I was running efforts in Austin and we had these giving days and um, we had special prizes for nonprofits, extra money, extra challenges, extra matches, extra calls to action um, during the morning, midday, and at five o'clock. So this is for Austin, Texas, right? We worked around like when people were um, at work and we're getting all the emails from the organizations. Um, and um, they were at lunchtime. And this is when we were just starting to see mm-hmm. after many years of doing the giving, uh, of doing the campaign, I, I think it was like the fifth or sixth year, we could start seeing that there was a trend in times of day um, mm-hmm. that people were most engaged. And it was always those hours of your natural day. And then also right towards the end of that moment, whatever that, that end defining moment is, was a golden hour because that is when a lot of people come to see how their organization did, organizations they love, what people are giving to, who's hitting their goal, who's not hitting their goal. Does somebody have a new match? And so I can speak to this from a financial perspective is when it's time bound, this is how sometimes it plays out in communities when they're doing their giving days. And it just follows the natural way of a person's day and then our natural ability to win. And, uh, or, and, and, and I don't mean that in a greedy way, but I just know that there were so many organizations that had their supporters and friends of supporters come in when they knew they were going to, you know, stretch goal or a new match. And, and so I think it was all about also, so it was prompts and it was also incentivization. Mm. Um, so and I think just all over the world, who I don't have that data, um, but and I'm looking forward to a deeper dive into this report <laughs> too. But um, I love the idea of calling them um, these moments or what was it, golden moments, mm-hmm. um, times of day. Um, but I think it, it, there's golden moments where it's maybe a time of day. There's flags, I think, in the ground. Mm. depending on a crisis or depending on a societal Mm. trend. Um, And I think that is the kind of general behavior that we are really trying to understand. 2020 and 2021, where there was these very specific moments, Mm. obviously, where people were were providing aid and driving participation and donor acquisition. But when you talked about it just a second ago about it's a two-way street. What are these organizations doing to create that relationship to move somebody from transaction to transformation? It is not magic. And it is definitely, that is the hard part, right? But Mm -hmm. um, to your point, you've given them that moment. How do you make that moment happen several times a year? And at least with our movement, we're hoping every Tuesday that people are waking up and not just thinking about Taco Tuesday, but thinking about (laughs) like Tuesday, it's giving Tuesday. Mm. What is my family doing today? And I think that is the behavior, the giving behavior that we want to influence. Mm. Um, And uh, so to your point, it is about moments and it's about calls to action and whether it's within a day or whether it's within a year. But it is also on the other side, the recipient, if it is an organization, uh, to create that relationship and that ladder of engagement. 
And I think that I would even argue that those are moments too, right? The peak moment is that thank you call. The peak moment is that next piece of it, right? Like one of the pieces in the research that's really interesting is that is how many people don't remember giving. Like when people are asked about how much they gave, who they gave to, people can't remember. When the data around their memory really increases is when they've been called within 48 hours and thanked in a really personal way, not gotten a Mm -hmm. stock email back, right? because that's the conversion to serotonin. That's the imprint in memory. And that's what them that, you know, I heard my whole fundraising career, call your donors within 48 hours. It makes such a difference. And I was, I was always like, really? Like, can't I just call them on Friday? Like, I'm just going to bucket it. You know, I'm going to be more efficient with my time, right? I'm just like 48 hours. Like, why does it really matter? And finally, 15 years later, reading this research about how that relates to chemical release in our brain and linking the dopamine experience to a serotonin experience. I'm like, why did no one ever just explain this to me like (laughs) fully instead of just saying this is kind of like, you know, quote unquote, best practice. And I think what you're saying that's so important, you know, someone recently said to me, I don't even consider someone a donor after their first gift. And I thought it was actually like this really kind of eye-opening experience. And it's kind of been echoed in my conversation with Francesco as well, which is like, we sometimes overassume as fundraisers that that first donation is in the door, they're in. Like they're in, they're a part of this with us already. And what Bo, what all of this is saying is, what all those guests were saying is, that doesn't mean that. That means that they had one positive experience with you and now it's your job to see if their follow-up experiences with you are gonna confirm what they felt the first time. And if we don't give them those follow-up experiences, it's going to be a one-time thing. Because actually when you go the next time and just ask them for money again, when they haven't had, they're going to be like, oh no, you thought that was a really nice organization last time. But then actually what happened after that didn't sort of confirm that initial belief or that dopamine hit or any of those things. And so I think it's a really interesting mindset shift. We focus so much on acquisition in fundraising. And, you know, then we know these really low sort of sector-wide retention rates, but we don't always know how to make the connection between why is that happening? And for me, even these folks just pushing back and being like, they're not your donor yet. Like that was a one-time deal. They are not your donor yet. Was just kind of a really big shift for me and how I think about all of these pieces. That's a really um, great point, not an encounter because I, so working in communities, uh, it's a, a range of who I work with. And sometimes it's a really sophisticated, well-oiled organization that is got resources to run these campaigns. And, um, and a lot of them, or some of them are focused only on monetary asks. Others are about mm. all acts of kindness. And it's about a, a celebration in the park in New Bern, North Carolina, you know, mm. like it, it ranges, right. Of what kind, what expression of generosity and what these um, movements look like. And the ones that are, um, focused, focused on fundraising and transactions. Those are the ones that I, um, not I worry, but I, I, I impress mm-hmm. upon the most about the, I can understand I've been a fundraiser for 20 years. I understand mm-hmm. that cash is king. You have a budget to make, you have money to make this world go around in your organization. I get mm-hmm. that, but not valuing a person for all their assets is a huge mistake. Mm. And a lot of people will say, I just need to focus on fundraising and financial. If I give them another non-financial way to engage, then they are going to pick the lowest lift. They're not going to give me money. Mm. And that's just the wrong way to think about it. So um, to your point, it's sometimes just the acquisition and then you're just like, I hit my numbers and, you know, mm-hmm. I did my thing and I, and you're usually overworked and you're one development, one person development shop. I totally, totally get that. But the easiest next gift is the one that you stewarded so well. But before that though, honoring and giving people multiple ways to give does not mean that they will only pick the low lift. It is giving them it's making that deeper connection with them. And um, as I think Liz said it a little bit earlier, yes, um, Giving Tuesday uh, brings in a whole lot of money, but yes, for lots of organizations, but it it really is the millions expression of generosity that is the other piece to this. And um, I think it's over two thirds of the donors that participate during Giving Tuesday are doing more than one act of generosity. So that means they're giving you time and money. They're giving you donated goods and money. Um, So, or if they're just donating a good 
whatever you, you know, that day, what are you doing with them to end up with a monetary gift a couple of mm-hmm. months later? Um, yeah. and so it's, it's a constant conversation that I have in this world. And I love our sector. I've been working in it for a really long time for big institutions, and small mm-hmm. institutions, but it, it definitely is very hard um, to, to, to have that mental shift. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I coach a lot around fear, around fundraiser fear and, um, and because I'm an executive coach and that is really what changed a lot of my personal fundraising was sort of being honest with myself about some of the beliefs I was holding about money and value and self-worth and all these things that get so tied up in the moment of asking, right? And, um, and that I felt like, honestly, as a fundraiser, there wasn't a lot of space to talk about either. And I... And like, so, you know, we hear things about, oh, you know, scarcity mindset, feel abundant. And I was always like, how, like how, I don't know how to cross that bridge from, (laughs) you know, working 80 hours a week and, um, you know, hardly making enough to pay rent and, and this abundance mindset that everyone keeps talking about. And I love that you said the word assets before though, around donors. And I think that requires a shift in organizations too, thinking about the assets of their organization as more as just the money they're bringing in the door as well. And I also think, you know, what you just said and and bring it back to what Liz said earlier, my guess is a huge amount of the donor retention that you see in the participation is actually because of that dual experience, because that's the serotonin experience right then and there, right? They're creating a memory with that organization right then and there. They didn't just just click a button. Not that clicking that button isn't a good feeling too, but they're getting both at the same time. And I think so often we hear, and I hear all the time from like clients and people in my program, like, oh, but if I do that, then they won't do this. And, I, and it's like that story is in our head. It's not even supported remotely by the data. You know, I hear people mm-hmm. afraid of starting monthly giving programs or inviting their major donors to monthly giving programs because then what if they give it a monthly amount? How do you help organizations maybe break through some of those fears or try and test things out or figure out how to adapt them to their own organization? That's such a good question. I know, it's giving- a good question. Yeah, but okay. Giving Tuesday has been um, a huge opportunity for experimentation with the with the organizations that participate, and we're not just talking about nonprofits. So, you know, corporations experimenting, communities experimenting, mm. people being innovative in ways that they hadn't considered. And for some reason, I think that because it's 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 an unusual event, from the very beginning, people thought, oh this is a great chance. Like it's not my year end campaign yet. Mm. This is a great chance to do something different. And, and then when it worked, they were able to carry that through to their year end. And I mean, we have data on, on our platform that shows organizations that participate and do a good job early on giving Tuesday, you know, starting before, during, Mm. and then carry through, do way better by the end of the month Mm. than organizations that wait. Mm. And, and so it's not about, um, oh, you know, it's such a busy time. I'm not going to be able to break through the noise. So I'm just not going to do it. It's, it's getting, getting in there and making the ask and then doing the thank yous and then the follow-ups and the celebrating every Tuesday, Mm. (laughs) all those, as you said, all those serotonin conversions. (laughs) I don't know if you wanted to add anything, Celeste, on the, on the question. Yeah, because I've also been there, right, where you're talking about Mallory in this 20 years mm-hmm. of doing this work is, mm-hmm. um, you know, I do presentations all the time about Giving Tuesday, and I'm talking to maybe, because we are a small team too, um, but we, um, so that's why we work at the community country level, mm-hmm. and then, you know, the, the principles and the work, and, you know, that we work with that group that then, you know, brings it to their community, and, but there's times when I will actually do presentations and work with a community leader to talk to their nonprofits too. To help move this mindset from mm. um, scarcity to abundance. And those are great words to use, but how does this play out in my day to day? And I have been there too when I hear somebody talking about just what I'm talking about and, um, and getting frustrated with that because that doesn't help just using those words, right? So, so tell me how this works. And so I, when I was running things in Austin and saying, when we would have, we lifted, we uplifted our spring giving day first, and then we became giving Tuesday community leaders and um, the community leader 
for that, for Giving Tuesday for that area. And um, so we had two campaigns within the year, calling on the community, calling on nonprofit organizations Mm. to engage in these community-wide campaigns. And again, most of my time as executive director was talking to organizations about like, why (laughs) do you do this? And then Mm. then after a while, I was like, well, then just don't do it. I don't know. (laughs) That is not the answer, right? (laughs) That is just the last floor is being very frustrated. But it it wasn't. It was just, it's a new way. Uh, I took it as an opportunity to help educate and to test and to, and to help them. But um, just to your point, Liz, um, I, I had a, when we first stood up, Amplify, which was the game, the day in spring, and then M Giving Tuesday. It was really hard for organizations to wrap their mind around how do these two things hang with all my other strategies within a given year. Mm. And if you only look at them in isolation or add-ons, that's what the success the success that you're going to experience. It has to be. You have to first have a goal towards it. Why are you even doing it? You know, what Mm -hmm. is it? Why are you even doing it? Not just because everybody else is doing it or my board said I have to do it, um, which I love that. But it's, um, you know, why are you doing it? Put some goals to it. And is this Mm -hmm. an opportunity to try something new? If this is like, Mm -hmm. hey, I'm just going to try this new irreverent marketing campaign or, you know, social media campaign, or I'm going to give this campaign over to our young givers society or whatever it is um, to do something different with it than we haven't been done before. But um, so a lot of our nonprofits that I was working with were either using the day as a, uh, just to try something new, something they had not done before, or something that was going to augment another strategy they had in that given Mm. year. So we had people Mm. who would use Amplify, they would raise all this money or whatever during Amplify. They had all these touch points and then on Giving Tuesday, it was a -a thank-a-thon. And they just Mm. thanked every single donor and made sure that that donor knew that the Giving Day was coming up the next couple of months, you know, and it was just being creative. And and I hate when people said that too, just be creative. I think you can be creative when you really know what, why you're doing this mm-hmm. and how it fits within your season of work and your whole entire calendar year. That is when you set yourself up for success. That's when you see success. And that's when you start changing your mindset is mm-hmm. how I saw it play out mm-hmm. many times in the community. Mm-hmm. I think that's such a powerful way to end this. And I could talk to you both for another few hours and I think we'd only you touch the tip. <laughs> <I must> know. <laughs> um, no, this has been so fun and I'll do a little outro with your contact information and links so folks can find you. But is there one call to action you want to make to everyone listening right now or one next step to invite them to maybe think differently about Giving Tuesday or participate in a new way? Where should we send them? Well, if if you happen to be a Canadian listener, please visit us at givingtuesday.ca and um, you'll find all kinds of toolkits. So if you're an organization, um, if you're a charity or nonprofit versus a school versus a sec, um, you know, higher education or a corporation, there's there's all kinds of different kits that'll help you get started. You can always reach out to us. Um, we love to talk one-on-one. So just info at givingtuesday.ca. So that's for Canada in terms of resources and in terms of call to action, if you're in doubt, yeah, give us a call. We'd love to chat. Um, if you're, you know, a skeptic, give me a call. That'd be great. <laughs> She's like, and and if you're awesome. not jump, jump in with both feet, because, um, I have very rarely heard anybody say they regretted participating in giving Tuesday. I think when we start talking to people that have been participating, they're so excited. And the research shows the same thing. Like people are inspired to give on, on giving Tuesday because they're part of something. Um, so, um, well for just giving Tuesday in general, there's giving Tuesday.org, lots of tools there, depending on how you come to the conversation, whether you're an individual looking to do something with your family, you're a school, you're a small business, you're a nonprofit looking to stand up something for giving Tuesday. There's content there for 52 Tuesdays. So every Tuesday is giving Mm. Tuesday, but I also would, um, you know, all of what we're talking about today is what we, uh, the foundation of giving Tuesday is what we call new power and the movement only moves and is grows as long as it doesn't grow. I mean, wait, I'm going to do it the wrong way, but basically, you know, success when the movement grows without you. 
but it's based around what he learned building Giving Tuesday. Mm. And that is the mindset. That's all the words that we're using and all of the things that we're saying and our values is very much what he observed while building this movement and why it continues to grow. Um, I'm not paid to promote his book, but what I'm saying is that even um, (laughs) Stanford's um, innovation there's an article of his that actually talks about new power. And then Mm. he has a book that augments that. Um, But that will hopefully then give you the inspiration to try something new and to go to the site with open eyes. Um, Mm. And and if you have a really bad, either you had a bad experience with Giving Tuesday, you, you know, don't like Giving Tuesday. I know there's a lot of people out there who don't like the day. Um, Give it a chance and really understand the the, the intention of the day and what it could do for you, your organization Mm. or your community. Mm. Thank you both so much for your time and for everything that you do and just um, sharing all of your wisdom with us today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for what you do, Mallory.